Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer Lutheran Church on this, the sixth Sunday of Easter. I'm Pastor Kevin McReynolds, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Redeemer Lutheran Church today. Um, you know, I know you guys are Lutherans, and there's one thing that Lutherans, um, they love, which is change. <laughs> so um, we thought we would give you some today. Uh, there are several things today, because today is uh, Cinco de Mayo, um, it's the 5th of May, that means it's the first Sunday in the month of May, and um, that means that we are moving into a new worship service that we'll be using today, so we're using Divine Service Setting 4. You'll find that on page 203 if you choose to follow along there in your hymnal today. So there'll be some things a little bit different about the service than they have been for the last two months, so prepare for that, but that's not the only change that we're introducing today. And that's why I thought I'd take a minute with you at the beginning of service to, uh, to fill you in. Today, as the first Sunday in the month, is a communion Sunday. And um, one of the things that we've been working on that dates back a while now, uh, we met uh, on a, back in February on a Saturday as an elders group um, to put together an elder retreat. And then we also invited the altar committee and the ushers to come to that meeting. And um, it's taken us a little while to implement this, but we're here today to be able to implement it and start today, which is we're gonna change things up a little bit. Um, it's more of a change for this first service than it is the second service because at this service, you guys would remember on Communion Sundays, we usually have three elders that assist with communion. Today, we're gonna to be changing that up so that we just have one elder assisting with communion. Um, and, and here's how it's gonna go. Um, our, all of our servants and helpers in the congregation um, will commune at the first table. So that means our ushers and our elder who is on duty for that day um, when it comes time for communion, uh, during the Agnes Day, um, they will be coming forward and I'll be communing them on this pulpit side over here. Immediately following that then, the elder will step into the chancel space, the ushers will be dismissed from that table to go out and start ushering you forward so that you can come forward to take communion. That is, everyone who can approach the altar. Um, if you're unable to approach the altar, uh, when the ushers are out to usher you forward, we ask that you remain in your seat, and um, we will commune everyone who is able to come forward at that point. Once we've got everybody communed up front here that can approach the altar, then those who remain who are unable to approach the altar, maybe due to some health issues, or knees, or hips, or whatever, um, then the the ushers will stand by you so that we know that we need to come out and commune you, me and the elder on duty that day. So we'll come out from the chancel space, I'll come out with the elder and I'll commune you. Uh, another thing that's probably worth mentioning that I left out was, um, and I've had a conversation with Carol and Joy who are up in the balcony, but we'll invite those um, folks that are at work during the service, which would include our musicians, also to come down forward for that first table as well. Um, and what that, what that does for us is um, a couple of things. We've been talking about it because we've got fewer elders than we once had. Um, like I said, this is sort of how we do it at the second service. And, uh, and we sort of are like two different churches in a way. Um, we had this discussion a while back at a congregational meeting trying to maybe go to one service and we elected to stay with two, but this is one of our answers to um, utilizing the help that we have and making use uh, of those resources that we have. So, is that clear as mud? Yeah, we'll take questions later, right? So, so basically it goes like this. Servants of the congregation will come forward, they'll commune at the first table. Once they are all communed, we'll release them to go and invite you to come forward and usher you forward for service or for communion. If you're unable to approach the altar, um, just let the usher know and uh, I will be out to commune you then. So um, that's how it's going to go. Uh, the other uh, quick announcement that I'll make now is I'm, we're going to be working, and I know this is tough because um, I keep making announcements, but immediately following this worship service, we have a, a congregational meeting, which is one of our biannual meetings that's set up by our bylaws in the congregation. And we're going to be holding that meeting here in the sanctuary. Um, in order to uh, operate efficiently, I'm going to try and get the service done in an, in an orderly fashion and quickly, which... I know nobody believes that I can do that, but I'll do my best there. But we're going to ask that you dismiss from the services here and then um, check in at the table and get your name written down so that we have your attendance marked so that we know that we have a quorum because that's one of our uh, requirements that we have by bylaws as well. 
So we'll ask that you exit. I'll greet you on the way out and then have you come right back in if you're a part of the meeting. And we'd invite you to be here because we have three very important things on the docket today. Uh, the first is our elections. Um, then we're going to be having a discussion about the potential purchase of a replacement or new organ for us here at the church because we've been having some issues with our organ. And then the third thing that we'll be talking about is the uh, potential vote for a deaconess here at the church. So um, very important uh, matters before the congregation business today, and we hope that you can stick around in between. And then the last thing I'll tell you is after the second service today, right across the street, um, I told you it was Cinco de Mayo. That's sort of where we began today. We're going to have a little time of relaxation and rest, and we're going to go across the street for some Mexican food and um, margaritas, I think. We might be due. <laughs> Virgin margaritas. Okay, so we'll be good there. But uh, we'd love to have you join us for that. Um, we're going to welcome our new members at that meal. Um, but we'll also spend a time in fellowship and enjoying one another's company. So we hope you can be a part of that. Uh, you don't have to worry about anything with that. Just uh, show up and be a part of it. We've got plenty of food um, and would love to host you for that. All right, with that, um, we're going to get underway this morning with our opening hymn. It's number 506, Glory Be to God the Father, We Sing. Please rise for worship. Again, we're following divine service setting four. You'll find that on page 203 if you choose to follow along in your hymnal. We make our beginning this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are feared. Since we're gathered to hear God's word and to call upon him in prayer and praise and to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. 
Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our service continues with the intro appointed for today, spoken whole verse by whole verse responsively. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. To God on high be glory and peace to all the earth. Good will from God in heaven proclaim that Jesus birth. We praise and bless you, Father, your holy name we sing. Thanks for your great glory, Lord God, our heavenly King. To you also be gotten, a Father's Son we pray. O Lamb of God, our Savior, you take our sins away. Have mercy on us, Jesus, receive our heartfelt cry. Where you in power are seated at God's right hand on high. For you alone are holy, you only are the Lord. Ever and forever be worshipped and adored. You're with the Holy Spirit, alone our Lord most high. In God the Father's glory, amen, our glad reply. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. O God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Our first reading for this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 34 to 48. Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. 
He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers were among the circumcised who had come with Peter, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is, fr is from 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite the congregation to please rise as we sing the Alleluia and verse. Alleluia. that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia. Hear now the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now have the opportunity to confess our common faith in the triune God using the words of the Nicene Creed. We confess. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our sermon, hymn number 829.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you all from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this morning's message comes from John chapter 15, the gospel lesson you heard read just a moment ago, specifically verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Thus far our text. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. So not only has our Lord laid down his life for his friends, but he has also risen for his friends. I've said it before, but the truth is, us Lutherans, we're, we're pretty serious, aren't we? We don't mess around when it comes to talking about Jesus, especially during the season of Easter. For these last two weeks in adult Bible class, we've been talking about the communication of the attributes within the economy of the Godhead. Yeah, sounds like a mouthful, doesn't it? But wait, it gets better. Beyond that, we've been talking about the genus idiomaticum, that's fancy Latin terminology for how the attributes of both the divine nature of Christ and his human nature are communicated into the person and the work of Christ. Maybe more simply put, we've been talking about how we can more faithfully speak about how Jesus is both at the same time God and man simultaneously in the same person. And when we can talk about Jesus like this, we speak more accurately about the work of Christ. At the end of our time in class last week, which was shortened due to a visitor that we had who was speaking, our potential deaconess candidate, I made mention of the fact that when Christ died on the cross on Good Friday, that God was crucified. God died. Apparently, this caused some folks to think about the implications of what that might mean. You mean God died on Good Friday? Yes, Virginia, that's what I mean. And you should understand it to mean that too. Which prompted then someone to ask me on the way out of class, you're going to have to speak more on this, Pastor. And I said, you're not a moron, Jeannie. <laughs> She's probably not here right now. I was just waiting to get her. And yes, I did plan to speak more on this now. So here we are, only one Sunday removed from this little conversation, but we don't have Bible class today. Instead, we've got a congregational meeting in between services, like I mentioned. So I'm not trying to squeeze in Bible class into worship services. Rather, as I spent some time preparing to speak more on this later, I had to speak to clarify the work of Jesus, the God-man, that happened on Good Friday. Well, while I was doing this, I found some resources that support the church's confession that God died on Good Friday when Jesus was crucified. And what was striking to me was that they pointed me specifically to the Gospel of John. And in addition to that, to this thing that Jesus said in our reading today in verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So what better time to discuss this than right here, right now, with all of you, as this is our appointed reading for the lectionary. God must want us to speak more on this, and not just because we're morons. Instead, we talk about it because it's important that we make a clear and accurate confession of our Lord. All three persons, as we did in the Creed, but as we talk about Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. Jesus says himself in Matthew 10 and Luke 12, whoever confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. And so it's incumbent upon people who are a part of this church, not just Redeemer Lutheran Church, but the church with a capital C, the one true church who makes the good confession about our Lord to speak in accordance with the Holy Scriptures. And one thing, one very important thing that we confess is what happened on Good Friday, because on that day God was crucified. I suppose it does sound a bit harsh when you think about it. Maybe Jeannie wasn't so far off base when she said, I need to hear more about this. But if it's not true, this harsh reality that God died, then we're in big trouble. The fact is, it is true. And it's a truth that we, as the church, shouldn't 
and don't shy away from. In fact, we, we make confession of it as we did moments ago, as I said in the Nicene Creed. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered. Some would say that God can't suffer. And yet the true church has always confessed that he did. And not only did he suffer, but he also died. And in the Apostles' Creed, we spell it out even more clearly. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He died. And while these are the church's creedal confessions, we really serious Lutherans have subscribed to an even more specific confession regarding the crucifixion of God in the flesh. When I speak of it in terms of the tradition we call the Book of Concord, specifically the formula of Concord, Article 8, paragraph 44 to be exact, where it says this, quote, We Christians must know that unless God is in the balance and throws in weight as a counterbalance, we shall sink to the bottom with our scale. If it is not true that God died for us, but only a man died, we are lost. But if God's death and God dead lie in the opposite scale, then his side goes down and we go upward, like a light and empty pan. Of course, he can go up again or jump out of his pan, but he can never have sat in the pan unless he had become a man like us, so that it could be said, God dead. God's passion, God's blood, God's death. According to his nature, God cannot die, but since God and man are united in the one person, Christ, it is correct to talk about God's death when that man dies, who is one thing or one person with God. End quote. So the formula of Concord says it quite plainly. Not only did Jesus the man die on Good Friday, but more bluntly put, because Jesus is God and man at the same time, it's proper to say that God died on Good Friday. God is dead. God is dead remains as one of the most famous quotes of German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, found at the beginning of his work, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, can't say that fast three times. <laughs> His quote is oftentimes taken out of context or misunderstood, which led to one of my favorite philosophy jokes. You didn't know that you could tell jokes about philosophy. This is it. <laughs> Nietzsche says, God is dead. God says, Nietzsche is dead. <laughs> Nietzsche's statement was not referring to the death of God as we're talking about it here, but it was instead referring to how the Enlightenment had contributed to the erosion of religious belief. The systems upon which the world had been founded, this religious belief, and sadly, I suppose it's true to say that much of what Nietzsche's concerns were have now come to fruition, because we live in a time when more than half of the people in our country, when polled about what religion they belong to, would respond with the word, none. For them, God is indeed dead. And it doesn't matter that God came in the flesh because they won't even confess that. Because what Nietzsche expressed is alive and well. But this is not true for those who confess with the church. When we say God dead, God crucified, we mean the God-man Jesus, God incarnate in the flesh, died on Good Friday at the cross. And it is the thing that Jesus spoke about in our text today, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. The death that Jesus died was not because he had done anything to deserve it. In fact, it's quite the opposite. He'd done nothing to deserve the punishment of death. But his death became for you the substitutionary atonement, the giving of a blood sacrifice in your place, so that God, the Father, would be satisfied. Jesus was a stand-in for you when he bled and died on the cross. He was the vicarious satisfaction. Vicar meaning the servant, the servant who satisfies. God the Father was satisfied with the blood sacrifice that Jesus gave in your place and that you received through the water of baptism. Hebrews 9.22 says there can be no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. 
And as I look around, I don't see anybody here who has shed their blood for the purpose of achieving their own forgiveness. No, that was done for you by Jesus. Jesus shed his blood so that you wouldn't have to shed yours. So it's important that we confess God in the flesh, Jesus, the second person of the Godhead. It's also important that we confess that Jesus, as it says in the scriptures, gave up his spirit in John 19, 30. Therefore, it is proper to speak of the death of God. The death he died, he died once for all. And he died according to his flesh, we say. Francis Pieper, in his work, Christian Dogmatics, Volume 2, says this, quote, Through Christ's substitutional obedience and death, God's wrath against mankind was appeased. In other words, his judgment of condemnation was set aside. Romans 5.18, By the righteousness and obedience of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And in Romans 5, verse 10, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Pieper goes on to quote another dogmatic work, one that I particularly like. It says, quote, a change of attitude on the part of God is meant. And this reconciliation between God and man on account of the death of Jesus took place not by a fiat of his power, but through the intervention of Christ as a mediator. In other words, by the death of his son. End quote. It is an admittedly strange thing to think that God would require death as payment for the disobedience of man and ultimately the punishment that came from that disobedience, death. How could a loving God require death in payment for death? Why couldn't God just forgive us and call it good? Why did God have to send his son in the flesh to be born of a woman, to suffer, and ultimately to die? These are tough questions. Strange things to have to struggle with, to think that God actually died in the person and work of Jesus. But maybe to help us think of it as less strange, we could hear another author, Richard Bauckham, from his book, God Crucified. It was a required reading of mine at seminary. Maybe this will help sort it out. Several quotes from his book. We must consider Jesus as the revelation of God. He is the servant in both his humiliation and his exaltation. He is not merely a human figure distinguished from God, but in both his humiliation and his exaltation, he very much belongs to the identity of the unique God. This God is not only the high and lofty one who reigns from his throne in the high and holy place, he also abases himself to the condition of the crushed and the lowly. God is seen as God in his radical self-giving, descending to the most abject human condition. And in that human obedience, humiliation, suffering, and death being no less truly God than he is in his cosmic rule and glory on his heavenly throne. These are not contradictions, Bauckham goes on to say, because God is self-giving love. As much in his creation and rule of all things as in his human incarnation and death. It was in that quote that I heard the echo of Jesus' words from our gospel today. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. So we see not only God in his sovereignty and rule over all things, but we see him in his lowly, common, relatable death in the person and work of his son who is still very much also God. Which is a reminder of last week's epistle lesson from John, 1 John 4. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. God's love is expressed 
in the person and work of his son who bore in his body what you deserve, death. He's not just his creative, cosmic, sovereign father in the heavens, but he's also a sacrificial, lowly, relatable one who is dead in the son. But he's not just dead. He is yours through the person and work of the Spirit. He is love expressed in this way. And how did we put it last week when we heard this reading? Whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. We know that dudes and dudettes, well, they abide, don't they? Or were you not here last week? So abide. Live in this love shown in its highest form, in the lowliest way. Live in the forgiveness of sins won for you through the death of Jesus because he didn't just die, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all human understandings guard your hearts, guard your minds, and make you alive in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Please stand as we join together in the prayers of the church. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who come to hear God's word, that they would rightly fear God and learn what he has done for their souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the work of our missionaries, that in every nation there would be people who fear God, who do what is right and, believing in Jesus, receive the forgiveness of sins in his name, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the people of God, that like our Lord Jesus who loved the world and laid down his life for all, they may also lay down their lives for others in love and service. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our nations and the world's leaders, that God would cause them to serve wisely for good in accord with his revealed order. And though we do not always know that the, what the master is doing through the authorities that he gives, that we would make ample use of the freedom that Jesus has given us in his name to ask the Father for everything, as friends and fellow sons. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who are in sorrow or need, who are in sickness or adversity, especially those listed on our bulletin and those we name before you in our hearts and minds, that they would receive from God all of his good gifts of healing a body, they would receive grace to bear the cross, and finally, a blessed end and the gift of eternal life in his kingdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for all who come to this Holy Supper today, that having received the testimony of God through the water of baptism, they would also receive it in the very body and blood of Jesus in the fellowship of this altar, and so overcome the world by faith in him. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the suffering and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. We rejoice in his victorious resurrection from the dead and draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. For to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated now as we collect our gifts and offerings to the Lord. Also at this time, a reminder to please fill out the fellowship cards located in the pew in front of you. On the proper side, one side's for guests and visitors, the other side for members. Once you've filled out the card, please place it into the offering basket as it's passed down your aisle, and in that way we can properly acknowledge your presence with us in worship this morning. Thank you.
Please rise as we continue with the service of the sacrament. Again, just a quick reminder that uh, servants of the congregation will come down the aisle over here and be the first table to commune prior to being dismissed to invite you to the altar this morning for the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and on all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh, and you laid on him our sin, giving him into death, that we might not die eternally. Because he has now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Sabaoth adored, heaven and earth with full acclaim, Shout the glory of your name. Sing Hosanna in the highest. Sing Hosanna in the Lord. Truly blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but would have eternal life. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. By his death, he has redeemed us from bondage to sin and death, and by his resurrection, he has delivered us into new life in him. Grant us to keep the feast in sincerity and truth, faithfully eating his body given into death and drinking his life's blood poured out for our salvation until we pass through death to the promised land of life eternal. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Jesus Christ, true Lamb of God, you take the sin of the world away. Jesus Christ, true Lamb of God, have mercy on us, O Jesus Christ, true Lamb of God, you take the sin of the world away. 
word of dismissal for those unable to approach the altar this morning. Now may this true body and blood of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the one true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace, enjoy your sins are forgiven. Amen. Please stand as we join together singing the Nook Dimittis. O oh Lord, now let your servant depart in heavenly peace. For I have seen the glory of your redeeming grace. A light to lead the Gentiles unto your holy hill. The glory of your people, your chosen Israel. to the Spirit forever three in one. For as in the beginning is now shall ever be God's name resounding through all eternity. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn number 808.
Well, once again, uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you for joining us in worship today. Uh, that last song, I have to tell you, uh, back in my old circuit, I was in Nebraska, and we had a church in Grand Island, Nebraska, that was, uh, it was an entirely Spanish-speaking church called Cristo Cadero de Dios. And uh, I went to an installation service there, and that last song that we just sang, they sang at that church. And I thought, well, what a perfect sort of uh, Mexican flair for today, since it's Cinco de Mayo. And it came up in the list. I think they maybe did that on purpose and put it in the list of selected hymns for today, so it fit neatly with that. Nicely done, guys. Um, I won't belabor the point. Uh, as I shared with you at the beginning of service, we have a meeting in between services here. Uh, I'd love to have you join us for that, but the way we have to do that in order that we can make sure that we have our quorum is to um, dismiss you and then have you come back in for the meeting. But prior to doing that, uh, two quick announcements. The first is congratulations um, on a successful rummage sale. I don't know what the total is, but I know many of you help, and uh, many of you came and uh, did some shopping at it too. So uh, good job to all of you, and thank you for your help. Um, also, uh, we had a, I had an email in the office. We have um, a person who will be joining the church, uh, presumably, um, in the near future because they've just moved down here and they've been in contact with me and have worshipped with us in the past as well, who um, needs a little bit of help moving either Monday or Tuesday, said it would be a very small uh, load of things that they needed help with, but if you're interested, please catch me and I'll get your number to this individual um, like I said, it just came and I got the message um, this morning when I got in and I'm passing it on. So if you're interested in helping just a couple of things moving, they said it wasn't going to be too much one trailer. Um, they'd love a little bit of help and uh, it'd be nice if we could give it to them. So with that, I'll dismiss you. Have a blessed day and week in the Lord. And I hope to see you right back here in just a moment and after church across the street.